Under the Earth Once recovered from their skirmish, the group moved carefully down the stairs, Mala and Alyssa in the lead. There were about fifty steps. Along the way, four shallow alcoves held stone funeral slabs, empty of bodies. Aaron had Sram hold a torch close to one as he examined it. The stone was decorated in engraved Duran knotwork. Each had the ale brand name displayed prominently. He found a trace of cloth and marks in the dust that indicated a body had once lain there. He looked at Sram. The druid whispered, A welcoming party? The sorcerer nodded. Four slabs, four creatures. Who were they? In life, I mean. Duran lords keep bounded retainers in their household. Those that pass before their master are often entombed in their grave, waiting to serve them in the afterlife. It is a sign of favor. They caught up with the rest of the group, who had stepped into a long, vaulted chamber. All four walls and the arched ceiling were designed with impressive Duran craftsmanship. The flickering torchlight threw the carvings and guardian statues into semi-life. In the center of the chamber was a raised stone platform, on which sat an equally impressive stone sarcophagus, even though it had been despoiled. The carved and crafted lid had been pushed off and lay on its side, against the stone box. One edge had broken and the debris lay along the raised steps. From their vantage, no one could see into the coffin itself. A rin moved around the room, attempting to get a better view of the lid. The relief image of a Durin in ceremonial armor held a carved shield. Urin took the torch from Sram and held it close, reading the Durin runes written there. Here lies Segrimus Aelbrand, son of Geridon, son of Claiborne, son of Geridon. May he find peace in the halls of his ancestors. Danica snorted. <laughs> so much for that, she whispered. She looked at Theo. Are you going to check it? The monk looked unsure. Uh, it, it seems disrespectful. Hmm. Theo, the disrespect has already happened. We're looking for a druid, and in case you haven't noticed, this is a dead end. Pun intended, and we haven't found a druid. You know, Arryn said, it is common for Durin lords to build false chambers to fool tomb robbers. It might be that this isn't Segrimus Hailbrand's actual resting place. Theo grimaced. Alyssa sighed. I'll do it. She climbed the platform and Theo went with her. They peered over together, carefully, and their expressions turned to puzzlement. No body, Theo said. But there is a hole, Alyssa added. Good call, Duke said, grinning at the sorcerer. A few minutes later, Mala squeezed through the cracked floor of the coffin and dropped ten feet to the floor of a second tomb. The diffuse torchlight from above revealed this one meant to be even grander than the first. Though this room had six more empty alcoves, no ghouls attacked him. As the rest of the party dropped down, Mala walked around the chamber, double-checking they were alone. Again, an impressive sarcophagus sat center stage, and again the lid was moved aside, though this time it hadn't fallen. Unlike the room above, this one had an archway with another set of descending stairs. Alyssa took one look at the stone coffin and said, This one's different. Be careful. What? Why? whispered Theo. There are weakolic seals around the rim. Broken? Both Sram and Aaron nodded and agreed. Arryn said, Alyssa is right. Those are meant to prevent malevolence from escaping. They are a ward against evil. This time Danica was less flippant when she said, Again, someone else has already done the deed. We're just seeing what's left, right? Again, Arryn held the torch high and tried to get a good look at the shield engraving without actually getting near the sarcophagus. It took some awkward straining, but he was eventually able to read the runes. Here lies Sagamus Aelbrand, son of Geridon, son of Claiborne, son of Geridon. Though he ended his days in poverty, he brought much wealth during his life. May Tork and the Forge Fathers keep him at peace in death, and his shadow forever locked away. Duke frowned. So the guy was broke when he died? It doesn't appear so, Arryn said, pursing their lips. 
The Durin word for poverty is synonymous with evil or bad. Likewise, wealth is good or righteous. He frowned. It's less than a wholesome literary relic of early Durin culture, in my opinion. Sounds like modern imperial thinking to me, Danica said. Well, Theo said, I'm checking. This time Alyssa drew her dagger and followed the monk. He glanced carefully over the edge, eyes alert for any sudden surprise. This time, there was a figure in the coffin. It was the desiccated corpse of a Durin warrior. He wore rusted mail and a severely patinated bronze helm. His beard was dried and many of the hairs had cracked and fallen away. Most notably, the dead lord, presumably Segrimus himself, had gloved hands with twisted and broken fingers, as if he had been holding something until it was torn away. Theo looked at the corpse's sunken eyelids and gave a slight shudder, then turned to the others. It's a body, but whatever he held seems to be mis- The corpse's misshapen hands thrust out of the coffin and grabbed the monk by the throat. Theo was taken completely by surprise and could only turn back in dread. As the shriveled face of Segrimus Aelbrand rose toward him, the monk began to hyperventilate and his eyes turned a strange shade of gold. Alyssa recoiled as well. The corpse's dry jaw opened wide and it screamed in the rasp of a voice long silent. For their dead! For their dead! With every move and every word, the body crumbled. Theo beat the arms away and they shattered into dust and bone shards. When the words were shouted, the thing's face fell away too. First the jaw, then bones and flesh above. A cloud of dried meat and powdered bone exploded into the monk's face. He coughed and retched, falling back from the open box and struggling to keep his feet. Duke half caught him as he fell back. Theo released the low sound in his throat. More growl than a cough, his golden eyes wide and panicked. It caused the pilot to shy back. Then, like that, Theo's eyes were normal and frightened again. Duke doubted whether he'd seen anything at all. All around them, weapons had been drawn. You all right? Duke asked. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Theo coughed again, watching the coffin warily. Whatever had happened was over, though none of the party seemed ready to let their guard down. What did it say? Danica asked. He said, where is it? Arn answered. The sorcerer looked at the carved relief on the sarcophagus lid, noting the distinctive axe in Sagramus's grip. The axe! Duke exclaimed. The demon axe the Mili Ruha said Richland tried to chop down Old Man Oak with, Marla added. Sram nodded. Seems about right. Duke looked carefully at Theo. Uh, Are you sure you're all right? Theo had recovered his wits, but still seemed more shaken than the rest of them. He tried a small smile and nodded. His eyes remained a bit wide. What was that thing? Danica asked. A ghost? A spirit? The unquiet shade of Lord Aylbrand? Aaron postulated. The bard looked around the chamber nervously. And where is it now? The sorcerer looked at Sram. Neither practitioner had an answer. Alyssa carefully stepped up to the coffin again and looked in. Body's dust? She stepped away and looked at the others. Where do we go now? Mala pointed a thumb at the arch. There are more stairs. They gave the sarcophagus a wide berth, then followed Mala down the stairs. They immediately found the wide steps covered in used-up candles and melted pools of wax. Between them, leaning against the walls, were dozens of stone markers all with Durin runes and sigils. Are they magical? Alyssa asked. No, they're prayer stones, Aaron said. The kind mourners leave at the sight of a tragedy. Duke knelt and read one, revealing his understanding of the Durin script. Great Torque, shield us from harm and keep us rich and wise. Sram smiled. That doesn't sound so bad. Duke picked up another one. Seven blessings of the seven fathers be upon the doomed and impoverished souls within. And that does, Sram added. Neither Urin nor Duke read anything else on the stones. They soon reached the bottom of the steps in another carved-out chamber. This one had a set of iron doors at the far end, and two stone braziers flanking them. Over the lintel of the massive doors was the Aylbrand rune. On the door hung a circular iron seal, etched deeply with words that Arun read aloud. All ye who step beyond this threshold, 
step from the light of wealth and gladness into the dark of malice and woe. There was a long beat of silence as the crew processed the warning. It was, of course, Danica who broke it. So, what in the shadow are we stepping into here? Sram noted a symbol painted on the doors in what looked like ink or blood. Look, that's the Druidic trail sign for bad, turn back. Of course it is. The door doesn't appear to have been opened in years, Alyssa said, investigating what she could see of the recessed hinges and the markings on the floor. She turned her head and held the hand up for silence. Do you hear that? The water sound is louder. She followed her ears, bending to a small four-inch crack at the base of the wall to the left of the doors. I think this goes through to the other side. Erin frowned and asked Sram, Is it true what they say about druids shape-shifting into beasts? His friend nodded. I... I see where your mind is going. You think the druid went through here? Possibly. Aaron cocked his head questioningly. Sram shook his head. I'm not going in there, he answered. Probably wise. Well, the door is trapped with a needle, Alyssa said. Likely poison. Unlocked. Can you beat it? Danica asked. Probably. Aaron looked anew at Alyssa. Are you a locksmith? Yeah, something like that. What luck? Aaron seemed genuinely pleased. Alyssa and Danica stared at him for a moment, then looked at each other. Mala asked, Are we doing this? All agreed, and Alyssa bent to the lock. Danica held her toolkit as she worked. She almost jumped when Phil lit one of the braziers, but soon after there was an audible clunk as the tumblers in the old lock shifted into place. The hinges were a bit rusty, but the Duran made doors pulled open with a little muscle. A shift in the air sent cobwebs dancing. The way lay open before them. The first to hit them was the smell. A mixture of dust, stone, and something faint but cloying, like milk gone off in the pail. The cobwebs were thicker as they looked in on an ancient hallway running left and right. Another, simpler, oak and iron door stood directly across the hall. Looking in each direction with the torch held high, they could see the hall turned into a large vaulted chamber to the left. To the right, the hall ended about sixty feet away in what appeared to be a stairway down. As the party glanced back and forth, trying to decide on the best direction, Alyssa caught a flash of movement toward the stairs. A low, crouched shape scuttled on all fours across the flagstones, over the lip of the stair. Though it appeared humanoid, its movement was stuttered and quick. Before it disappeared, she caught a glimpse of pale, white, glowing eyes. We're not alone, she whispered, then sent a flicker of light toward the spot. Something was watching us from over there. What? Duke asked. I don't know. Better not to have something at our back, Theo said. There were nods from all around and they moved toward the stairs, weapons at the ready. When they approached, Mala boldly stepped up and looked down the stairs. There was nothing there, but the stairs themselves had collapsed into a pit of some kind after ten steps or so. Or whatever it was, it must have crawled into the rubble, he said. While the big fighter kept watch, Theo checked another door on the right side of the passage. It was locked. This time Phil took up the lockpicks. Alyssa eyed her suspiciously but the young wood elf only raised an eyebrow and grinned innocently. A few moments later, she pushed the door open. It was a storage room. Rows of crates and barrels lined the walls. A few big rats scurried away from the torchlight, but there was no other sign of movement. Whatever curse befell this place, they didn't waste time taking their supplies with them when they left, Theo said. He was about to step in with the torch when Phil put a hand out and stopped him. Hold on, she said, then pointed at two crates stacked near the center of the chamber. Those with Savani and Trolla eyes could make out the markings. A large red X, then smaller Durin runes. I may not be able to read the rest, but that X hasn't changed since Pyramite was first discovered. Theo looked wary, but unconvinced. So? Duke took up Phil's explanation. Even freshly mined Pyramite has a strong, sympathetic connection to fire. Old Pyramite, on the other hand. Old Pyramite draws flame like honey draws bees, Phil finished. Step in there with that torch and the whole thing could go boom, including those, she pointed to a rack of ten lamp oil casks. After weighing the risks, the group decided to leave the storage room unchecked. 
Phil carefully closed the door and turned, when a movement on the arched ceiling caught her eye. What first appeared to be a dense shadow resolved itself into a contorted figure clinging backward to the stone. She screamed a warning as it dropped onto Duke, a horrid black mouth opening beneath its pale white eyes. The warning wasn't quite in time to help him. The creature tried to gouge Duke's eyes with long black nails and sank yellow teeth into his exposed throat. From every shadowed corner and dark nook in the hall, more of them attacked, moving with deceptive speed. They seemed to be made of as much flesh and rotted cloth as drifting shadow. All had haunting, pupilless eyes and gave out muted wails as they launched themselves through the air. As Duke fought his assailant, another leapt onto Phil, smothering her in moldy cloth and shadow. Keeping her feet in her senses, she rolled backward, drawing her rapier and kicking it off, then making a diagonal cut, center mass. Another fell on Danica and two harried Theo. In the swirling shadows, it was difficult to tell their numbers. Wherever they struck, coldness seeped past armor and clothing, even when nails and teeth didn't score the flesh. Mollus struck out with his axe, but they seemed to melt away from his blows. Arden screamed, Sluwa! then sent an arcane blast of fire at the nearest, doing little more than singeing it. Sram summoned his vine whip and ensnared one about to jump on Danica. The barbed thorns wrapped it tightly. When he yanked, the slua was shredded and fell apart with a fading cry. Danica summoned her bardic voice and sang out a note that sounded like broken glass scraped across fiddle strings. The slua she focused on fell back under the spell. Alyssa was waiting and cut it in half. As the crew focused, the tide turned. What at first seemed uncountable became a half dozen. Then two. The terror turned to driven determination. Duke and Phil destroyed another and there was one. Together, they surrounded and cut it down. Uh, what is a slua? Theo asked, breathing heavily and bleeding from several bites. Alren intoned a spell and healed the worst of the monk's injuries, then answered his question. Slua are the restless dead. They are spirits that flock to cursed areas and sources of evil and shadow. They are excellent at hiding and only take physical form when they attack. They are said to be able to track a living soul anywhere, Srams added. According to the tales, they are summoned by the hunt and roam on moonless nights. My grand told stories about them when I was a child, Duke said. Oren went back to checking their surroundings. Rightfully so. Where to now? Mala said gruffly. Down the broken stairs or back the other way? They chose back and stopped at the door directly across from the entrance. Alyssa did the honors of unlocking it, and Mala gave the handle a tug. Inside was what appeared to be a small chamber. The size was difficult to gauge, however, due to the large amount of rope-like webs that filled the space. Theo gave a groan of protest. Aren's delicate features turned to a pout. Everyone had their weapons drawn. Spiders, Danica whispered. Sram looked bemused. What's wrong with spiders? he asked in a hushed tone. Nothing when they're tiny, Theo answered the same way. Arin nodded their agreement. Can we burn the webs away? At least see what's in the room? Alyssa asked. Theo whispered a word of power and a ball of flame appeared in his hand. Before anyone could react, he tossed the fire in. Wait, wait, Phil blurted, but it was too late. Theo winced. There might be more pyramide in there, Phil said, backing away from the door. The rest did the same. The flame burned away a ten-foot swath of webs, revealing no pyramite and nothing else in the chamber either, except for a missing chunk of floor and more webs, this time woven into a tunnel of sorts, disappearing into the hole. Sram did the same, this time aiming the flame at the tunnel. As the fire burned the web, a weirdly childlike scream emanated from within. A moment later, an enraged spider the size of a large dog lunged from the hole and attacked. Arin was ready. As soon as it appeared, he hit the oversized arachnid with a perfectly aimed firebolt. The flame struck it on the head and whooshed to life as it engulfed the creature. It continued to scream, but its legs began to shrivel. Phil placed the killing shot with her crossbow. That's a big spider, Theo said. He moved into the room, kicking the spider once to make sure it was truly dead. When it didn't move, he checked the hole. The space beneath was uneven, natural cavern, and curved away in a descending slope. A great many more webs lie in the narrow cave. Looks damn scary down there, the monk kept his eyes firmly on the hole. Do we think our druid would have come this way? Alyssa asked. A locked room with nothing in it but a spider hole? Danica said. I can't see why. I agree, Sram said. We should leave it for now. They backed out of the room and closed the door. Turning the only direction left, they walked toward the large hall. 
Supported by several carved pillars, the chamber was further across than the torchlight could travel, and was twenty feet high. The floor had fallen away in several long crevices, and someone had placed makeshift wooden bridges across them. Even damaged, it was still the most impressive room they had seen so far in the Durin Holt. A stone wellhead was situated close to one of the nearby walls. While Phil examined it, Theo and Alyssa moved up to the crevice edge and looked down. It was immediately evident to both that the flagstone flooring was held up by a series of support columns. Thirty feet or more beneath was a natural cavern floor, uneven and full of stalagmites and rubble. Theo also realized the edges were extremely dangerous where the columns had been compromised. He moved carefully away, told Alyssa to do the same, and warned the rest. Phil reported the well was fairly shallow and appeared to have water in it. From a location near the chasm, they could see another of the large stone braziers across the gap. Sram threw a conjured fireball into it, and the light blazed up. Noting the curious fact that the braziers and sconces all seemed to have oil, Alyssa examined one. These sconces and braziers are connected to some kind of drip feed, she said with admiration. I don't know how much is left in the system, but... She set a torch to a sconce and lit it with a small puff of lamp smoke. We can take advantage of the light. Lighting the sconces as they moved, the group crossed the rickety bridges one at a time. They found another door, and another set of stairs leading down, and decided to check the door. It was unlocked. When they opened it, they found a long room full of more crates and more webs. After a careful explosive and spider inspection from Phil, they burned a path through until they found a skeleton on the floor. Sram knelt and examined the skull. It's a forest lion, he said. Behind him, Urin searched the crates. Could this have been the druid's companion? Theo asked. The Mili Ruha said her name was Yona, Sram said, and yes, it could have. Right, Yona. If it was her pet, then she came this way. No one disagreed. Arin stepped up and showed the group a handful of gemstones they managed to find in the crates. Duke whistled. Nice. Danica eyed the stones a little covetously. And the rich get richer, she whispered. There were only a few fist-sized spiders, but they scuttled into cracks and crevices when the light or flame came too close. There was a short, steep set of stairs down at the far end of the room. When they burned their way through, they found a small landing and another impressive iron door. Again, Theo was about to check the handle when Alyssa's told him, Stop! He did, and she pointed to a section of flagstones on the threshold. Pressure plate, she said. Theo scowled. Why? There's obviously something valuable or important beyond. Give me a minute. It took that long to announce she had successfully picked the lock. While she couldn't be sure, she thought she had disarmed the trap, too. In case of mistake, she said, Maybe don't step there anyway. The doors opened with protest, anchored on the other side by dozens of web strands. They set them alight like all the others, but Theo was starting to fidget and grip his blade too tight. Does anyone else think this is a lot of webbing for one giant spider? Definitely, Duke said. The passage turned to the right and they looked across a big room completely crisscrossed in sticky webs. Like the previous Grand Hall, the floor here had been supported by columns, but in this case it appeared the entirety of the structure had given way. Thousands of pounds of debris, including crates and furnishings, lay along the cavern floor, beneath a blanket of more webbing. They threw a torch down to get a better look. It burned a small hole in the webs and gave fitful illumination to the debris, along with a few sinister-looking sacks dangling from strands or fastened against broken pillars. Are we doing this? Duke asked. In answer, Theo took a coil of rope from his pack and looked for a good tie-off. When it was secure, he said, I'll climb down and burn away a safe spot. Assuming I'm not attacked immediately, you follow after. When they agreed, he pulled on a pair of gloves and slipped over the edge. A minute later, he was crouched on the uneven floor with a globe of fire in his hand, setting the webbing around him alight. Nothing jumped out and attacked, so the others followed him down. By unspoken agreement, everyone began whispering. Theo said, The footing is pretty bad, but if we move slow, we can make it. They began their slow trek across the debris, burning as they went. They passed a dozen small meal sacks, but left them alone. There could be little doubt they were dealing with much more than a single spider, but no other creatures had yet shown themselves. When they passed the first large sack, Arin whispered, If we're looking for Yona, we should check these. The suggestion was met with varying looks, but no one disagreed. Mala took a torch and burned his way to the silk wrap bundle. Looking briefly at it, he ran the edge of his axe along it, then the torch. 
dark, fluid bones and an awful smell fell out. Whatever it was, it appeared humanoid. But the skull was too flat and wide for an Oroka, and the spine attached too far back. Half the group had their hands across their noses and disgusted looks on their faces. Duke was checking some of the smaller sacks out of a morbid sense of curiosity. They appeared to be large rats and cavern insects of one type or another. It's like a damned feasting hall, Alyssa whispered. Yeah, but where are the feasters? Danica asked. Duke held his torch high, checking the shadowed ceiling far above. I, for one, hope we never find out. Phil had moved a tiny bit ahead and held out her torch. I think I see a good flooring up there. The way might continue above. They moved to follow her. Mala said, Lead the way.